Shall we begin? I'm really, I get so excited when I prepare these things. So, uh, what do you see in the picture? How many, just you get to vote, how many see an old woman? Raise your hand. How many see a young woman? That's about 50 50. Can you, those of you who see a young woman, can you see an old woman? Have you seen this before? Have you? This is fairly old. Winston Smith has not seen it before. This goes back to my abnormal psychology class, I think, with Alan Moulton, no less. But it's about perception. What we're going to... But, but here's, here's my point. Well, I, uh, we see the same picture. We're experiencing the same data. Yeah, if you can't see what your neighbor sees, help them to point it out. Because... Uh, Yet we see different conclusions. We're working with the very, exactly the same data. That's the point. How can we look at the same data and draw different conclusions? I think that is a very good introduction to the question, does God exist? Because we've all got the same data. And for some of us, it's like any idiot knows that he does. And others would say just as vehemently, with just as much I hope, intellectual integrity, any idiot can tell that God doesn't exist. We're looking at the same data. So what makes the difference? And the other point on this is when you see what you see, it's very difficult to see what the other person sees. But we need to. That, that's sort of the challenge, to respect the other and not just call them idiots or blind <laughs> which is what I'm tempted to do, but to say, no, I can understand how you would assimilate the data and draw that conclusion. I disagree with you, but I can understand how you would draw that conclusion and vice versa. The point here is this. It takes more than objective evidence to convince somebody about reality. You can talk about the evidence all day long, and it may not change the way a person thinks. What is needed is a new way of seeing. All right, does that introduce the subject? I really like that introduction. uh, And we're going to close with it. We're going to come back to this uh, this picture. Uh, If you you Google things like optical illusions on your, you'll find all sorts of, it's fun to choose. I didn't, had a hard time choosing which one to use. Does God exist? I think there are three possible answers to the question. Uh, Maybe there's more. But uh, A, no. The blank there. B, if you skip down, the answer is maybe. (laughs) And C, the answer is yes. If there's more answers than that. We can talk about that later, but I think those are the three basic categories. No, God does not exist. This is the answer answer, answer of what? What's the, what's the atheism? And think about the word atheism. T-H-E is the root word for what? Theos is the Greek word for God, and if you put an A in front as a prefix, what does that do in the Greek language? Anybody know? It's a privative. It's a negation. It's like the N-O-N in English or U-N in English. So an atheist is a no-God person. It's, there's, it's a negation of God. Words are interesting. A theist is one who says there is a God. An atheist says there is no God. After the ugly atheism of the 1960s, and those of you who are my age and such will remember, I can remember saying the Lord's Prayer in school, reading the Bible in school, public school, public school. My seventh grade teacher on Monday morning would go to the chalkboard and say, how many went to church yesterday? How many went to Sunday? And she would... She would tabulate it, Mrs. Pell. I mean, she would. But then Madeline Murray came along 
and had a court case. Prayer was thrown out of school, and it was a pretty ugly mess. Uh, and the God is dead theology, what you were, Nietzsche, Time Magazine had a lead story, God is dead, but it was atheism. But in the 70s and 80s and 90s, I don't remember hearing much about atheism. It sort of went dormant. You had that Jimmy Carter was born again and mega churches were going and people didn't talk much about atheism. But about 2006 or 2007, it came back with a vengeance and atheism suddenly popular again. Um, after the ugly atheism of the 60s, believing in God's non-existence seemed to disappear for several decades. But in recent years, there has been a resurgence of unbelief as witnessed in the popular writings of Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchens, and company. Okay, you're aware of that, I think. This is a little old news now. That's ten years ago, eight years ago. Atheism asserts that matter is the only thing that matters. Matter matters. And there's nothing more than matter. Carl Sagan said it most succinctly, the universe is all there is or was or ever will be. It's matter. Nothing more than matter. There's no super matter. There's nothing beyond matter. There's nothing that transcends matter. It's just stuff. Three, perhaps the fatal flaw in atheism is this. If God does not exist, then existence is meaningless. I mean, the story has no plot if there's no author. If there's no creator, there's no meaning. But if existence has no meaning, then this sentence has no meaning either. And whatever you think you heard doesn't matter either. <laughs> it really is. It's a dead end. It's a dead end. And this statement of C.S. Lewis is so good. Consequently, atheism turns out to be too simple. If the whole universe has no meaning, we should never have found out that it has no meaning. That's a very good statement. It takes meaning to talk about meaninglessness. So you've just refuted your own position if you're trying to have a meaningful conversation about meaninglessness. Just as if there were no light in the universe and therefore no creatures with eyes, we should never know it was dark. I love the way Lewis's mind works. It just, he's, he, he gets it. So, uh, atheism is one of the answers to the question, does God exist? Or how some people have answered it. Others say, B, maybe. Perhaps God exists, but we can't be sure. This is the answer of, what's the name for this position? Agnosticism. And think of the way this word is built. What does the G-N-O-S mean? Knowledge. And if you put an A in front of knowledge, what does it mean? I don't know. <laughs> That's what it means. I don't know. An agnostic is somebody who doesn't know. Does God exist? I don't know. Maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. But living with a non-answer to life's most important question is usually either a mask for intellectual laziness or a lack of moral courage. Claiming I don't know is a cop-out. Those who say I don't know usually mean I don't want to know. And you just sort of want to grab them around the collar and say, this is the most important question of existence. And what do you mean? You, you don't care? You don't care enough to think it through, to take a position? I think sometimes we just, they need a kick in the seat of the pain. It's lazy. It, 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 not always. But I don't want to paint with too broad a brush. The weakness of this position is its own inherent inconsistency and irrationality. How can someone know that God is unknowable? How can one be sure that everything is unsure? 
And again, if, for an agnostic, if they say, well, I'm, I believe in agnosticism, you just ask them, are you sure? And you, what you're doing, you're challenging their assumptions. How can you be sure that everything's not sure? Third answer to the question, does God exist, at least that has been given, is yes, God exists. This answer can take multiple forms. And let me just uh, say up front here, the Bible, how, does the Bible treat the question, does God exist? Not really. It assumes it. First verse of the Bible, in the beginning, God. It's just sort of, there's an assumption that that will resonate with people. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. That's Psalm 14. So the Bible just assumes it. But these are the different forms of yes, God exists. Uh, one is deism. God exists, but he, or maybe she, or maybe it, or maybe they, <laughs> is unknowable. God is like a watchmaker who created a watch and then went away to let it run on its own. Such a being is distant and impersonal. Who are some people in history that were deists? Thomas Jefferson, Ben Franklin, some of our founding fathers were deists. They would talk about God sincerely, but it was a sort of an impersonal God, a distant deity. Another answer is polytheism. Uh, there are many gods. The storm god, the vegetation god, the sun god, the, wind, the wine god, the war god. So pick your favorite deity and worship him or her or it. <laughs> okay? And virtually all the religions of the world except three worship many gods. Because I think the data is pretty, if you believe in deity and you look at the, nature from, the, the data from nature... Like today, what God is in charge? <laughs> I mean, I, it sort of depends on the day, the weather, the climate. Um, but virtually all the religions of the world, you, in Nepal, they worship many gods, right? I mean, Hinduism and um, monotheism. Three religions have concluded there is only one sovereign God, and they are all these three religions, are all children of Abraham. That is incredibly interesting. That when God chose Abraham and revealed himself to Abraham, got, Abraham's children got it. Whether Jews, Christians, or Muslims, there's only one God. There's only one God. Um, and fourth category, and we could add other categories, but Trinitarian theism, that's what you are, whether you know it or not. <laughs> um, you're not just a theist, you're a Trinitarian theist. Unique among all the options is Christianity's claim that God is one, yet eternally existent in three persons. And the word person there is very important. Just ask Jerry Coleman about person. He'll talk to you about person. And the reason we can talk about personality and personhood is because of the discussions in the third and fourth centuries about the Trinity and defining God as persons. One God, we don't worship three gods, one God eternally existent, the second person of the Trinity didn't begin to exist in Bethlehem. The second person of the Trinity took on flesh in Bethlehem. But the second person of the Trinity is eternal. Okay? Now, that's just sort of background for our question. Does God exist? Let me... I've, I've been collecting books today and I added one more before I left the house. But I want to share with you two uh, testimonies. Anybody know the name Anthony Flew? Ah, Kaylin, what do you know? Well, what do you know about Anthony Flew? Or he was an atheist, and in his life, I don't know if he became a theist, but he at least became a deist. 
Yes. Okay. Yes. He did not become a Christian, okay. to my knowledge. But he was one of the... This, what do you know about Anthony Fu? I'm very impressed, guys. This is good. No, same thing. He, he was a form, one of the foremost uh, thinkers in, in atheism. Pretty hard the, the subtitle for this is How the World's Most Notorious Atheist Changed His Mind at age 81. This is impressive. So he spent like six decades as a philosopher. He's the son of a Methodist preacher. That's what sort of draws me to this guy. Um, and the title is, There is, and the word, There is No God, and the word no is scratched out. There is a God is the title. This is by Harper. I mean, it's a serious book. This is a... Um, Anthony Flew, son of a Methodist preacher, was perhaps the most notorious atheist of the 20th century. At age 81, he renounced... 81. One, just think the courage. This, he did it, I think it was in New York City at some conference. He, uh, he came out with this. He renounced his atheism and announced to the world, quote, I now believe there is a God. His conversion, however, was to theism, maybe deism, not to Christianity. But this is huge. This is huge. I mean, I don't, I don't think he's in heaven. I don't, I don't know what God will do with this, but this was a huge, and it shook the philosophical world. Just about the time... Uh, Hitchens and all these guys were writing their pop books. This guy came out and said, these pop book authors, you know, don't know what they're talking about. I mean, it's really... And this is the kind of book you want to give to your grandson or whoever in your family has suddenly come out and saying, I'm an atheist. This is like, this is not a Christian book. You just say, slip them something like this and say, just read what some thinkers are saying. It gets the door open. It gets the door open. Um, let me see. I put. If you ever look at my books, you'll see what I underline places. And I must say again that the journey to my discovery of the divine has thus far been a pilgrimage of reason. It's not a pilgrimage of faith. He's saying, I reasoned my way into this. But again, that's a good use of reason. Reason can't save you, but reason can get you to the place where faith becomes a viable option. Faith saves you, not reason. But he said, I've been thinking wrong about the ultimate ultimate, the absolute absolute. I have followed the argument where it led me, and it has led me to accept the existence of a self-existent, immutable, Immaterial, omnipotent, omniscient being. You can say amen to that if you want to. I mean, this is a, it's not Christian, but the, the questions people around us are asking, we need some ammunition. Anthony Flew is one. I put a few quotes here. Flew's examination of the recent research on DNA, and just before I go further, do any of you know this book, The Language of God? I've got a few nods. Uh, Francis Collins was the head of the Human Genome Project, one of the world's leading scientists. He worked with, was it uh, Bill Clinton on the Genome Project or something? I mean, this was big news. But it was mapping the DNA molecule. And, uh, yes, you, yeah. Um, and uh, he says the code in the DNA is so incredibly complex. You know, there has to be a code maker. There, and he's a Christian. He's an evolutionist, but he's a Christian. So read, read carefully, but this is a name. Again, the language of God, a science. Scientist presents evidence for belief. Um, but it was in, as Anthony Flew was becoming acquainted with this research, particularly on DNA, that led him to a belief, I'm back in my paper here, on the first bullet, Flew's in examination of recent research on DNA led him to a belief in intelligent design. 
In other words, when you see the code in the DNA helix, double helix, he says there's got to be a designer. That evolution cannot, or, or a random collation of atoms can't account for that. He asks, how can a universe of mindless matter produce coded chemistry? That's what Anthony Flew asked. How can mindlessness produce mind? He said, that's, I can't account for that. There's got to be a mind, a designer. I mean, it moves you to realize that. I, I liked this quote. This is a quote from Flew, second bullet. I, Anthony Flew, was particularly impressed with Jerry Schroeder's point-by-point -point refutation of what I call the monkey theorem. You'll like this one, the monkey theorem. And this is posited seriously by many. This idea, which has been presented in a number of forms and variations, defends the possibility of life arising by chance using the analogy of a multitude of monkeys banging away on a computer keyboards and eventually ending up writing a Shakespearean sonnet. I mean, this is the argument. If you have enough monkeys and enough keyboards and enough time, eventually somebody, some monkey, will produce a Shakespearean sonnet. And this Schroeder actually put monkeys in a cage and said, let's just try it for a few weeks. You know, and, and, and his experiment said n never one word was, not even a single word. They would urinate on the typewriters. <laughs> I mean, it was like, it, it just, and he said, you can do this for millions of years, but the, the complexities of it. Anyway, after hearing Schroeder's presentation, I told him that he had very satisfactorily and decisively established that the monkey theorem was a load of rubbish. It's a good British way of it's rubbish. Uh, and again, this is not a Christian talking. This is a, 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 the world's most notorious atheist who said this kind of thinking is crazy. This is real stuff. The next bullet, he's quote, I'm quoting, I must stress that my discovery of the divine has proceeded on a purely natural level without any reference to supernatural phenomena. My discovery of the divine has been a pilgrimage of reason, not faith. I mean, bless his heart. I, I really want him to take one more step. But he said, reason got me here, not faith. I'm just looking at the data. Last bullet. Some claim to have made... Yeah, this is the sad statement. And this is really the closing of the book. Some claim to have made contact with this mind. I have not yet. He's dead now. But who knows what could happen next. Someday, I might hear a voice say, can you hear me now? <laughs> but I love this guy. I, I love his honesty, at, I think humility. And maybe he did hear a voice. I don't know. But he, he, he had the possibility of faith. Faith saves, not reason. often a cop out. Um, it, there are also, I don't know, does mean no. It means that perhaps that individual needs assistance, as I don't. Very good. Um, with these types of testimonies to navigate yeah. that terrain, to understand um, how that information uh, can help them. I think that's a very good comment. And, but it's a good thing. It's not a no. Yeah. It is a good no, thing. No. Right. So there's suspended, opportunity. suspended state. So Anthony Flew is one example of someone answering the question, does God exist? All right? It's just sort of exhibit A, at least for tonight. Another one, and you know this guy is one of my favorites, C.S. Lewis. And he did not start out as a Christian. I think I mentioned this. When he was five years old, his mother was sick, 
And he prayed and prayed and prayed, God heal my mommy. His mother died. And Lewis became, I think he would have said an agnostic, but atheist probably works too, until he was in his 30s. Um, and let me, let me read some here. Um, in his autobiography, in mine, uh, mine is falling apart, surprised by joy, uh, and I love the title, what was the name of the woman he married? Joy Davidman. Surprised by joy. And that story, he married a woman with cancer who died and his struggle with grief. But it's the story, it's, it's, Lewis just connects in ways. Uh, in his autobiography of his early life, Surprised by Joy, Lewis describes how as a young man, he didn't want God to exist. He wanted atheism to be true. Why? Because if God existed, he would, and this is Lewis's word, interfere with Lewis's plans. God does that. <laughs> if he exists, he's going to mess up my life. And frankly, I don't want him to exist, so I'm going to be an atheist. And he's honest enough to talk about that. Here's a, one of his quotes. This is Lewis. No word in my vocabulary expressed deeper hatred than the word interference. But Christianity placed at the center what seemed to me a transcendental interferer. <laughs> this is so funny to me. Nobody else is laughing at the parts that I laugh at. <laughs> there was no region, even in the innermost depths of my soul, nay, there least of all, which one could surround oneself with a barbed wire fence and guard with the notice, no admittance. And that was what I wanted. Some area, however small, of which I could say to all other beings, this is my business, mine only. And if I say there's a God, he's going to mess that up. And he's exactly right. And it's not that he's looking, he's looking for God. The reality is God is looking for him. The hound of heaven thing. For several years, this struggle continued. But atheists have a problem. How can you hide from the one who is omnipotent, the hound of heaven? And this is the book where he says, atheists can't be too careful what books they pick up to read. <laughs> He's like, because there's evidences for God everywhere. You've got to be really careful if you're an atheist. Here is the rest of the story. Now, this is a famous paragraph. You must picture me alone in that room in Magdalene College, night after night, feeling whenever my mind drifted even for a second from my work, the steady, unrelenting approach of him who I so earnestly desired not to meet. <laughs> that which I greatly feared had at last come upon me. In the Trinity term of 1929, I gave in, and I admitted that God was God. <laughs> and I knelt and prayed, perhaps that night the most dejected and reluctant convert in all of England. <laughs> I did not then see what is now the most shining and obvious thing, the divine humility which will accept a convert even on such terms. The prodigal son at least walked home on his own feet. But who can duly adore that love which will open the high gates to a prodigal who's brought in kicking and struggling, resentful, darting his eyes in every direction for a chance to escape? That is a marvelous paragraph. Um, I should have gone one page further on page 237. That's really his conversion to theism. Let me tell you his conversion to Christ. It takes about two sentences. I know very well when I became a Christian, but hardly how the final step was taken. I was driven to whipsnade whip one Sunday morning. When we set out, I did not believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And when we reached the zoo, I did. <laughs> <laughs> you have to love this guy. 
And he goes on to say that it wasn't that it was emotional. And what he's saying is God's sovereign hand was on me. God was giving faith to me. I didn't reason my way there. God revealed himself to me. And I went to the zoo on a Sunday. And when I got on the bus, I didn't believe in Jesus. But when I got off, I did. <laughs> oh, I was going to read you one more. Um, yeah, in this language of God, he quotes um, Robert Jastro. Robert Jastro was an astrophysicist. And in the last paragraph of his book, God and the Astronomers, this is a, another famous quote. For the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He's about to conquer the last highest peak. And as he pulls himself over the final rock, He's greeted by a band of theologians who've been sitting there for centuries. <laughs> Good stuff. Okay. Let's, um, I got two other things I want to do with you, but I wanted to share just two testimonies because I think the best way to sort of enter into the question, does God exist, is to just enter into the story at least of two people who really, who really wrestled with the question. Anthony Flew, C.S. Lewis. This is the way philosophy has traditionally answered the question with A, B, C, D, E, F answers. And then in Roman numeral 5, we're going to close tonight. Well, we're not, next to the last thing we do is we're going to look at how the Bible, one place the Bible answers it in Romans chapter 1 three verses, and then the last thing we're going to do is look at one of Pascal's pensées, the wager. This is good, okay? That's where we're going. We're, we're on good time. All right. Throughout history, many have sought to prove God's existence. Somewhere in C.S. Lewis, he has a line where he says something like, the thought of us talking about God reminds me of a mosquito on the back of an elephant. <laughs> you know, it's like it, this is com there's something comical about us asking the question, does God exist? It's like Tim's prayer helped us. You know, it's like it's something comical. So I put it in quotes. Many have sought to prove God's existence by appealing to rational, logical arguments. Now, that's what Anthony Flew said he did. That'll get you to a certain place. It won't save your soul, but it'll, it'll get you down the road. To some, this may seem analogous to pointing a flashlight at the sun to help others affirm its existence. I like analogies. That's a good one. Proving God is like pointing your flashlight at the sun. But the great benefit of such proofs is not that they make faith inevitable, if faith was inevitable, it wouldn't be faith, right? But it makes faith possible. So what you're trying to do when you're witnessing or talking to your non-Christian, atheistic, agnostic friend or family member, you're not trying to convince them. You're not going to do that. You're trying to give them enough rational evidence to make faith on their part possible. That, that's, that's important to see that distinction. So there are one, two, three, four, five. I think I've given you six. It, the numbers vary. But A is the cosmological argument. I'm going to make you write these big words down. C-O-S-M-O. -O, cosmo. The word cosmos means world. Cosmological argument. And the basic argument is the universe is there. Account for it. And the short answer is God. <laughs> and if you don't have God in your argument, then you've got to come up with an how do you account for the universe? The argument. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. There must be a cause for all that is. A first cause. 
and virtually all human history agrees with this. Only sort of enlightenment atheists have tried to come up with a reason with leaving God out. Illustration. This is Peter Kreef's illustration. Think of a train moving down the track. The caboose is pull, pulled by a boxcar. Oh, so that explains the caboose, the boxcar. But the boxcar is pulled by the tanker. Oh, that explains everything. The tanker is pulled and you go down and you reach the point where surely there's an engine somewhere pulling this train along. That's Peter Kreef's argument, and it's the cosmological argument. You, you keep going back, and even if you say, well, the, bing, the Big Bang explains everything, it's like, no, it doesn't. Who, how do you explain the Big Bang? you got to just keep pushing it back, and you reach the mystery point where the only answer I know is God. <clears throat> okay, that's the cosmological argument. A lot of people have used that kind of thinking. B, the teleological argument. T-E-L-E-O. Teleo, which comes from the Greek word telos, which means the end or the purpose. That things appear to be intelligently designed for a purpose. Why is your ear shaped the way it is? And when you look at it, it's a pretty amazing shape. Well, there's a purpose. It catches sound waves in an amazing, and you've got two of them. It's like, wow, it's almost as if somebody designed that. Yeah, it's like how you think time plus chance and random molecules collecting came up with that. It's like the monkey theorem. What's that? It takes a lot of faith. It takes a lot of faith to be an atheist. The argument. Where there is design, there must be a designer. That's the argument. If there's order, if there's beauty, if there's harmony, the laws of nature. Why do we call them laws of nature if there's not a lawgiver? The Milky Way. Incredibly beautiful. DNA. The ear. Wasn't well, long ago, I was with my grandson and I picked up a dandelion. Have you ever looked at the structure of a dandelion? That is the most amazing. The, the, the beauty of it is just a dandelion, a weed. But beauty, structure, the teleological argument. An illustration, and this goes back to William Paley in 1802. You've heard it. If you're walking through the forest and come upon a watch lying on the ground, how do you account for the watch? And William Paley just takes that and says, there's got to be a watchmaker. You can't just say it just got there. It, it, it's counterintuitive. Uh, these arguments don't convince everybody. Yeah, Andy, but... Why do you have that sentence there, this is a universe, not a multiverse? Why do you oh! Have uh, I, we may have mentioned this a few weeks ago. The word universe, the word university. Where did that word come from? And the idea of a universe and a university is that there's a unity to all knowledge. Whether you're in China or whether you're in Bolivia, knowledge is true. Whether you're on Mars or whether you're on Earth, it's a unified knowledge. It's not, it's not a multiverse. It's not a multiversity. We're getting there. We're getting where we don't believe in truth because we don't believe in the truth giver. So all things are relative. Things fall apart. They don't. Yes, yes. Maybe I'm not hearing your question. Well, Ask it different. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking of it in terms of uh, parallel reality. Oh no, I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm not going. To, I'm not there on that question anyway. I'm not there. It, it's it's when science was birthed. Uh, Rodney Stark is an author who writes on this. He asked the question, why is it that in human history you had lots of cultures, for example, who practiced astrology? They looked at the stars and said, oh, astrology. And they came up with the zodiac and there's influence in the skies. But why was it only in Western Europe 
And he would say, why was it only where people believed in Trinitarian monotheism did they make the jump from astrology to astronomy? Why? And he said, Trinitarian monotheism. That enables you to think it's a universe. It's not just a multiverse or a polyverse. There's something, someone holding it together. And that's how we have science. And ironically today, science is so hostile to the very being who gave it birth. Uh, Isaac Newton. It's called politics. Politics, <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's uh, Isaac Newton. These guys loved G Galileo, and they were all Christians. Uh, maybe not evangelical Christians, but they believed in the Judeo-Christian understanding of reality, and it led them to science because they said there's order out there. And the planets that don't... You know the word planet means wandering. So the stars, they don't wander, but the planets wander. But people like Galileo said, but there's a law for that. That's not just random. And there is. But that's science. And it's out of Christianity. That gets me excited. Um, C. This is, a, this is a good one. And you need to read. There's a lot of material on this. The anthropic principle. I'm making you write big words. A-N-T-H-R-O-P-I-T-C. Anthropic. What is the root A-N-T-H-R? Point two. Man. Anthropology. Anthropo it's the same root. The universe seems to have known we were coming. Anthropo that man was coming. The universe seems to be constructed for man, particularly the, the, the world. It's, the axis is just at the right tilt. The spin is just at the right speed. The distance is just the right distance from the sun. If any of those things were off by just a degree or two, it wouldn't work. And even the, uh, I read this recently, even our earth is positioned in the Milky Way so we've got a good view of the Milky Way. There's many places our little planet could be in the Milky Way where you couldn't see the rest of the stars. And the point of this argument is it's almost as if this was all divine, designed for humans. It's like, that's exactly what Genesis says. That's exactly what Genesis says. God prepared a garden. And it's not for the animals. The animals are there for man. Man is given dominion. Human beings, man and woman. The anthropic principle. The argument, our planet seems perfectly designed for human occupancy. It is almost as if someone knew we were coming and set out a welcome mat. <laughs> and here's, a, this is in Anthony Flew. He gives, he gives this argument. Imagine entering a motel room where your favorite music was playing, your favorite food was in the refrigerator, the TV was preset to your favorite stations, and your personal toiletries were all carefully lined up on a shelf in the bathroom, and your favorite magazines were spread out on the coffee table. Could this be coincidence? <laughs> no, somebody knew you were coming. And that's what this planet is. It's, it's designed for our enjoyment. The anthropic principle. You need to, uh, there's a lot of literature on this stuff. D, the moral argument for the existence of God. The inner conviction of right and wrong and the blank there, conscience. Conscience. The argument here is everyone has an internal voice, every human being who has ever lived, in every tribe, every nation, every language, has this little voice that speaks to them about what is right and what is wrong. Where did this come from? If there is a law, there must be a lawgiver. Where did this notion of right and wrong... And Animals may have some of it, but they certainly don't have it like humans do. Right 
and wrong. And if you'll remember, I read to you in the previous Bible study the first page of Mere Christianity. This is where C.S. Lewis starts with his argument, children on the playground. In fact, this is where I got it. Illustration, children on the playground arguing about right and wrong. That's not fair. You have to share. Don't be a bully. I got here first. You promised. Where does that come from? It's, it's the image of God in us. There's a lawgiver who made us in his image, and we've... How else do you account for it? Immanuel Kant, not necessarily an evangelical Christian by any means, but this is his fav, famous quote, Two things fill the mind with ever-increasing wonder and awe. The starry heavens above me, and anybody know the second one? The moral law within me. Kant said, these two things I can't get away from. The starry heavens and the moral law. How do you account for that if not for God? Are you having fun? I am. Okay. E. This is a good one. And this is a relatively new way Christians are arguing, and some of you are aware of this, irreducible complexity. It's not just that things are complex, they're irreducibly complex. Let me try to explain it. This is um, the argument. The complexity of many organisms and structures, and let me just pause here. Darwinism and evolutionism typically teaches the way organisms develop is piece by piece over time, a piece here, a few centuries later, a piece there. And so, for example, a, a bird. You know, how do you get a bird? Well, it takes millions of years, according to the argument. You have to add feathers. You have to add hollow bones. You've got to get wings. But it's not just you've got to get those things. You've got to get them at the right time, at the same time. Because if they don't come at the same time, it's not a bird. It won't fly. If you have hollow bones but no feathers, you're not a bird. <laughs> you follow me? It's got to, that's the argument. The complexity of many organisms and structures is such that they could not have occurred by numerous successive slight modifications as Darwinism demands. The pieces had to all come together at one time. I mentioned birds. Or think of the eye. How many pieces does it take to make the eye work? But if all the pieces aren't there, the eye doesn't work. So it's not an eye. So how did we get it? You just can't add rods one millennia and cones the next. I mean, I, I don't know. You've got to... Uh, or the bacterial flagellum, if you've... Uh, there's a documentary called Expelled. Any of you watched Expelled by Ben Stein? That is, but he really plays on this bacterium. It's like this little thing in our cells that wiggles its tail to float around in the, in the body. But it's a very complex. Here's the, here's the classic illustration, the mousetrap. The mousetrap has five parts. Now, this is just five. It's not like the eye that has hundreds of parts. This just has five. There's a wooden base, a holding bar, a spring, a hammer, and a catch. But all of them must work together. They must come together at the same time for it to be a mousetrap. If you've only got four of them, it's not a mousetrap. It won't work, so it won't reproduce itself as a mousetrap. Do you follow the argument? This is a very powerful argument, I think. I'm not a scientist, but it... Okay, yeah, if one part is missing, it's not a mousetrap. Here's a final argument for God. Man or mankind, I should probably say, is incurably religious. How do you account for the fact that everybody, everywhere, all the time, prays in some form? How do you account for that? And ask your atheist friend that. How do you account for that? The argument, though many have tried to eradicate religion, 
the French Revo Revolution turned Notre Dame, the cathedral, into the Temple of Reason. I think they made it a warehouse first. You know, they turned the seven-day week into a ten-day week. I mean, they tried to eradicate the name of God, and it was totally unsuccessful. Stalin tried it. Mao Zedong tried it. You cannot stamp out religion, this religious, incurably religious. There is a God-shaped vacuum in every human heart. Augustine said, you have made us for yourself, O God, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. This is a quote from C.S. Lewis um, for the illustration. Creatures are not born with desires unless satisfaction for these desires exists. A baby feels hunger. Well, there's such a thing as food. A duckling wants to swim. Well, there's such a thing as water. Men feel sexual desire. Well, there's such a thing as sex. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is I was made for another world. We're incurably religious. We've got this instinct to pray, to sacrifice, to build an altar. I mean, every culture, every culture, everywhere. And again, it's not that any of these in and of themselves are going to convince anyone. But when you put them all together, you've got to admit there's some pretty strong, rational, logical arguments for the existence of God. Okay? All right, we've got two more things to do. I've given you the scripture right here. Uh, Romans 1, 18 to 23. We've been looking at how philosophy answers the question, is there a God? Now let's just take one example, Paul, how he answers the question. Paul's most systematic presentation of Christian theology is the book of Romans. He begins... His presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ by discussing the existence of God. That's pretty significant to note. That the book of Romans, written to Rome, Rome starts out by let's just talk about the existence of God. In these few verses, Paul tells, I've named four realities about God's existence. See if you can pick them out as we read the passage, okay? This is scripture. Everything else, I've been, you've been hearing Stan, but, but let's hear something good for a change. Here we go. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness, unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. It's not that they don't have the truth. They suppress the truth they have. Because, or for, what can be known about God is plain to them. God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived. Clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, he says, you knew God. You, you are sinning against the light that you have. Uh, one of the books I didn't bring tonight is written by a lawyer and it's called Things You Can't Not Know. I love the title. Things You Can't Not Know. And that's what he's saying. There are some things you can't not know. That's what Paul's argument. You know this. You've known God, and you've suppressed the truth of God. It's willful. It's conscious. It's, a reject, it's rebellion. It's treason, which is exactly what the Garden of Eden is. Treason against God. We're all guilty. We're all traitors. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. 
but they became futile in their thinking and in their and their foolish what were darkened hearts not their mind the problem is not your mind you've got a high IQ pagans in Rome you've been to a lot of schooling that's not the problem the problem is your heart well said claiming to be wise they became fools Malcolm Muggeridge says there are some forms of foolishness you have to be highly educated to commit. <laughs> Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God. They ex- you had it and you exchanged it for images resembling mortal man, birds, animals, and creeping things. Now it goes on, but let me quickly give you four realities about God's existence. A, the evidence for God is overwhelming. Paul is not appealing to the Bible to defend the existence of God, but to nature. I like the fact that he doesn't start off talking to the Romans by quoting Genesis chapter 1 and 2. You ought to believe in God. Let me quote the Bible to you. No, he says talks about nature He's very smart the evidence is not because Genesis 1 and 2 is not true that's not the it's because your 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 listener is not going to listen to you if you start quoting Bible verses you just say look at the heavens around you the evidence is available to everyone everywhere all the time Paul says since the creation and the third bullet Paul says that the organ with which we think is our hearts more than our heads. The second thing he says about God's existence, B, the evidence from nature tells us two things about God, His eternal power and His divine nature. So He's powerful and He's divine. He's not human. He's supra-human. He's beyond... The cosmos is not all there is or was, or ever will be. There is something beyond the cosmos, someone. And he's powerful. This is enough evidence to condemn us, but it's not enough evidence to save us. That's... For that, for salvation, we need the revelation of Jesus Christ, which is what we get in chapters 4, 5, and 6, and 7, and 8 of Romans. C, a fourth reality about God's existence. The problem is not the absence of evidence, but the suppression of evidence. Remember the picture of the old woman we started with, or young woman? Paul is saying that some people have decided what the picture depicts, and no amount of rational argument will dislodge them from their opinion. Paul is boldly saying that those who deny God's existence are guilty of intellectual dishonesty. You're suppressing truth. They don't have the courage to follow the evidence where it leads them. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Malcolm Muggeridge said, we've educated ourselves into imbecility. Wish I had the use of language like that. Frederick Buchner, uh, this is a good sermon to preach, imagines what would happen I used this on Christmas Eve at Loudonville. This is memorable to me. It was a gorgeous Christmas Eve night. We had our candlelight service. And when I preached, I said, what if we go out tonight and in the stars, God has rearranged the stars so that in bold letters it says, I exist. (laughs) That's fun to think about. What do you think would happen? Buchner says, some would probably come to faith, but others would attribute the message to some natural phenomena such as swamp gas. I can see it now on, you know, Good Morning America. How do you explain the rearrangement of the scars that seem to spell, I exist? And some PhD in science somewhere say, well, it's swamp gas. You see, if gases go up into the atmosphere, it rearranges the way light is fractured, refracted. And... uh, What does it take 
Jesus said, even if somebody rises from the dead, some people won't believe. That's exactly right. Because it's not evidence that ultimately determines faith. Evidence has its place. Bonhoeffer said, I'm giving you all my favorite quotes tonight. He said boldly, when people complain that they find it hard to believe, it is a sign of deliberate or unconscious disobedience. That'll make you think. And then Jesus says it best of all, John 7, 17, if anyone's will is to do God's will, he'll know. He'll know. But if your will is not to do his will, you'll live in agnosticism all your lives. But if you will his will, Jesus said, you'll know. It's not your head. It's your heart. And D, for those who deny the existence of God, the results will be catastrophic. Paul says, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. God is angry. He's given us evidence, and we're suppressing it. We're exchanging His truth for a lie. We're worshiping the creation rather than the creator. And God's upset. Those who suppress the truth, they are without excuse. Later in Romans, Paul says that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world be held accountable to God. I love that statement, every mouth will be shut. At the judgment, no one will be able to say, it's not fair. God will say, you had all the evidence you need. Let me close with the wager. Um, I'll just read it, and then you can meditate on this tonight. One of Pascal's most famous pensées, we talked about Pascal a few weeks ago, was written for those who struggle with this question, does God exist? He realized that it takes more than evidence to settle the matter. It demands a decision. You must decide. Neutrality is impossible. Not to decide is to decide. In other words, if you say, I'm not going to decide whether God exists or doesn't. You just decided by not deciding. You must wager. You must make a bet. Either he exists or he doesn't. It's like the picture yourself in the casino. <laughs> it's a wager. It's a bet. But where will you place your bet? Now, here's his argument. This is Pascal. And this is, this is very famous. Try this on your unbelieving friends. Suppose you wager that God does exist and you live a life based on that faith. Suppose after death you discover, hmm, he doesn't. Pascal says, you've lost nothing and you've actually probably had a pretty meaningful life. You believed life had meaning. But it's not true, but you haven't lost anything. Then he says, But suppose you wager that God does not exist and you live a life based on that presupposition. Then suppose after death you discover He does. (laughs) You've lost everything. So what Pascal is saying, if you've got to make a bet, you're at the casino and you've got an option, I can bet on one number and if I win, I win $10 million dollars And if I lose, I lose nothing. That's that's the wager. He said, any idiot with no bet, gamble on it. Gamble that he exists. You have nothing to lose and everything to gain. Now, that's just how Pascal is pushing people to believe. Wow. Guys, we covered a lot of ground. What was I in? I had a... Can I read you Malcolm Muggeridge? Malcolm Muggeridge was sort of the Walter Cronkite of England. 
and he came to faith. I don't know at what age, but he uh, was quite evangelical in his faith. And he's got a chapter here, Is There a God? Well, is there? Mugridge says, I myself would be happy to answer with an emphatic negative. Temperamentally, it would suit me well enough to settle for what this world offers and to write off as wishful thinking or just self-importance of the human species any notion of a divine purpose. The earth's sounds and smells and colors are sweet. Human love brings golden hours. The mind at work earns delight. I've never wanted a god or felt under any necessity to invent one. Unfortunately, I'm driven to the conclusion that God wants me. And that's where he starts. He's secular. I don't want God, but I've been led to believe that somehow God wants me. The hound, and that's his next sentence. God came after me like a hound of heaven. Lord, thank you tonight. Thank you that we can pray, not to ourselves, but we can talk to you. Thank you that you've revealed yourself to us. And we pray you'd make our hearts receptive and tender. And if any of us are not willing to do your will, Lord, help us to understand that that is the source of all doubts. And help us to come to that place of full surrender, to want you more than anything else, and to know you, to know you face to face. In the name of Jesus and for the sake of his kingdom we pray. Amen. Bless you. Good night. See you next week. Yes, sir. Yes, it is. It's relatively new. Are you? It's ve- yes, it is. Moody Science Films. Maybe. Help me. This is to him. I'll get it to him. Next to Gus. Next to Gus. Here he is.